All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here today, and uh, thank you for those of you who are calling in over the phone from uh, from home or uh, whatever your quarantine location is. Uh, I want to start by giving just a, a brief update on some of our latest fi uh, efforts in the fight against COVID-19. As you know, we saw personnel currently deployed in hospitals in New York City, Detroit, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and other cities. After more than three weeks, the USNS Comfort will be leaving New York City, although I do not have an updated date of departure for you today. This is a sure sign of modest progress in mitigating the virus in the nation's hardest hit city and is a welcome sign. While in New York City and other locations, local officials indicate that the rate of infections and hospitalizations is declining, we are aware that there are other cities where that is not the case. Therefore, NORTHCOM is still taking action to ensure that DOD personnel and resources are deployed in the proper locations to do the most good. As of this today, we have more than 60,000 personnel deployed nationwide, including 4,400 medical professionals on the front lines. Although we're still on the front lines of the, the current coronavirus fight, we're also looking into the future. Your military continues to train, sail, fight, and fly around the globe. But like many Americans, we're eager to fully resume normal operations and are putting plans in place for that transition. To reach that normal operational status, we will be evaluating many different areas. One is training, which you've heard a good bit about in the last week or so. How are we protecting our trainees and how are we keeping the pipeline full? So we're continuing to look at that, continuing to adopt uh, and adapt so that we can uh, pursue full training classes in the future. Uh, secondly, we're looking at the, the stop movement order and when that will be lifted. Uh, right now it has been uh, extended until June 30th, uh, but once it is lifted, um, and the Secretary is reevaluating that every 15 days, how are we going to uh, deal with the backlog of individuals that need to move throughout the world? Uh, it's, a, it's a complex issue. Transcoms has, has the lead on it, but it's something we're looking at. Uh, with our strategic forces, uh, looking at how uh, we're going to continue to protect those forces, I think we've seen some, some great leadership from STRATCOM on this topic of keeping those forces protected and able to operate. Uh, but we're going to take lessons learned from this and how we operate those forces going forward. Uh, you've heard a lot about testing. We're continuing to develop our testing capabilities uh, and pursue lab trials and, uh, and clinical tr vaccines. Uh, we're going to be doing that for, for months and months uh, going forward as we ensure that we have the capability and we have the capacity and the stockpiles needed for, uh, for testing uh, our forces. Uh, next, uh, Ellen Lord is taking a hard look at our industrial base. So we're, we're taking a look at how uh, those industrial base companies, how their suppliers are uh, operating. Uh, how to ensure that in any type of pandemic or any type of, of crisis, global crisis, our, our, our uh, vendors, our contractors, our suppliers are still able to provide equipment. And then secondly, we're looking at how do we help our vendors for some of these crucial pandemic products, the PPE, how they're able to develop uh, their capacity and grow that capacity and how we can help them with that. Um, as I mentioned, our stockpiles, we're looking at what our stockpiles need to be. So we have uh, we came into this crisis with a, uh, a healthy defense uh, pandemic stockpile in place. We've used a, a good deal of that in giving uh, part of that stockpile to uh, HHS and FEMA to pass on to the states that need it, 20 million masks and additional PPE ventilators. Uh, we're looking at w what do we need to do to not only uh, rebuild that stockpile to where we have sufficient supplies for our, our own use, uh, but where our, our stockpile needs to be for a future pandemic or future crisis for the department. Uh, and then additionally, just ensuring that we have the capability and that our, our vendors and suppliers can provide that. And then last, uh, we're looking at uh, allies and partners. So what we can do to be helping our allies and partners around the world as they're, they're dealing with this crisis and as, as we uh, uh, ramp up our production of, of PPE, or as we ramp up our ability to assist, uh, how can we uh, be, the, be the, the best partner we can be for allies and partners around the world? So next, uh, I, know, I know everyone will ask, so um, uh, later today, Secretary Esper will meet with uh, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Gilday, to discuss the results of uh, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Burke's investigation into the circumstances surrounding uh, the COVID outbreak on the Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, I spoke with the Secretary about this uh, yesterday, and his position remains uh, the same. He's uh, going into this with an open mind, and he is uh, generally inclined to, to support Navy leadership uh, in their decisions. But he will uh, go into it with an open mind, uh, and we will, uh, once he's uh, briefed, we will see where that takes us. 
Uh, I expect that uh, after the briefing takes place that we will uh, be able to get you guys an update on on what the investigation's conclusions were. But right now we are uh, focused, continue to be focused on getting the TR crew uh, back to good health and back out to sea. So with that, I will, uh, I'll take questions. We'll start here, uh, start on the phone. I think we got Bob. Yes, thank you. Good morning, uh, Bob Burns here. Um, on that uh, meeting between Secretary Esper and Admiral Gilday, did you say, did I hear you say it's this afternoon? And, and also, you mentioned the Comfort um, leaving New York. Is it going to return to Norfolk, or is it going to do another coronavirus-related mission? So, uh, on on the meeting uh, right now, I think I said it's later today. I don't I don't have a, a time to share, uh, but it will be later today. Um, so, uh, as soon as that concludes, and uh, I have some guidance from uh, from the Secretary and from the Navy, we will we will try to get you guys some more information uh, on the on the Comfort. We, uh, we expect the Comfort will, will be heading back to, uh, to Norfolk, uh, where it will um, go through kind of the normal post-deployment uh, um, uh, cycle, where we will restock it. Uh, it will be uh, uh, just prepared for the next deployment. We have said from the start, uh, when uh, General Friedrichs and I were up here, you know, it seems like you know, months ago, uh, talking about this and with the Comfort and the Mercy both, we wanted to be very careful with our deployment of those assets because we wanted to ensure that they are mobile, they can be used somewhere else. So our goal all along has been to uh, use them in New York as needed, and then when the need no longer exists, to prepare them to move to the next location. Uh, we'll be looking to FEMA to identify where that next location is. Uh, they are the, the, the federal government's lead on this, and so they're the ones who will be tasking us with where they believe a 1,000-bed hospital ship with uh, over 1,000 medical providers is most needed uh, uh, on the east, or east Coast or, uh, or Gulf Coast. So uh, we'll be looking to them for that. But uh, we'll have an update on the, uh, the timing of that uh, in the coming days. All Sorry, right. just a quick follow-up. So you say it is returning to Norfolk, but it also is going to do another mission? Uh, we're going to look to FEMA on that. We're going to return it to Norfolk and prepare it for another mission. Uh, but that will be FEMA's call. So, uh, you know, one of the one of the great benefits of the of the Comfort is that it is uh, it is at sea and that it's mobile, and we can take it to a, a port city uh, and set up shop. Uh, one of the drawbacks is that it's it, it needs to be on the water, so uh, that limits the number of, of cities that it can be deployed to. Um, so, if there's a you know if there's an outbreak in Kansas City probably not going to Kansas City. Um, so, but we'll, uh, so we'll look to FEMA uh, as to where, where it's going to go and for guidance on whether that, that, that there's that demand signal for us to send it. Because if we look back to the comfort and the mercy, there was a very strong demand signal from the governors and mayors about having those assets be deployed. Um, and then as we saw them deployed, you saw the, the use of them change from an initial trauma uh, hospital to help take some the weight off of the local hospitals to a, um, a, a, a low acuity COVID hospital to uh, basically the frontline hospital uh, for COVID patients or one of the frontline hospitals for COVID patients. Fortunately, we saw that the demand uh, over time diminished and therefore we're able to see the, the governor and the mayor have uh, indicated that they no longer believe that they need that resource and we appreciate them returning it to our, our stockpile so that we can, uh, we can look to use it elsewhere. All right, Thank go, you. To the, go to the room. So as you guys start to test more and more troops who are asymptomatic, who is going to be tracking that at the point of the test and how are you going to release that information so we have a better view of who's symptomatic and who's not symptomatic in these numbers we're getting? Uh, so that's going to be a DHS is uh, sorry DHA is going to have the lead on on our testing efforts and so uh, we've been building out the program. Uh, they'll be working with the services uh, obviously uh, as the uh, the owners for some of the military uh, personnel and and tracking that that information and so. Uh, part of this is is learning about who who has the virus so that we can obviously protect the force and part of it is uh, taking efforts to to you know conduct science and learn more about the virus itself. So as uh, Secretary set up here before, uh, what we've learned from the TR is very informative, the number, the high number of asymptomatic cases. Uh, and so we'll continue to see that as we go, go forward. But the goal right now on our testing is uh, we want to get that those tier one, obviously tier zero, people who show symptoms, people who may have been exposed, we're going to test them as quickly as we can. 
but we want to get to a place where we can test uh, our tier one, tier two, and tier three assets. So those are the the strategic ones. Those are our our uh, our engaged forces overseas, and then our forward deployed forces, um, and then uh, working to a place where we have enough testing capability to test the rest of the force uh, as needed. And do you plan to release that spread of asymptomatic versus symptomatic, so we kind of know what we're really looking at with the numbers? I, I don't. I don't think there would be. There's. Uh, I haven't seen any conversation about that. I haven't, I, but this, on the flip side, I haven't seen any conversation about not releasing that. I, I believe that that would be information that uh, we've been cooperating very closely with uh, state, local, and federal health officials on information that we glean from uh, our testing efforts to as the the whole whole of government effort and in a uh, show of transparency and an effort to to. Uh, get to a solution for this. The, the same type of transparency we're asking for other countries and other, other governments, uh, we're, we're taking the lead on that, and so I expect we'll continue to do so. Okay. All right, we'll go, uh, go back to the, the phones. Uh, Lara Siegelman. Hey, Jonathan. Thanks for doing this. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything you can tell me uh, that the USS Kid has a significant outbreak on board. Um, how many sailors have it? Uh, when was this outbreak first known? And at what point does it have to return to shore to offload its sailors? So uh, I think the Navy will have some more information on this later today. Um, I, I think they're they're going through some notification procedures right now with uh, with the Hill and some others. But uh, I, I can confirm that there has been a a, a sailor on the OSS Kid who um, was. Uh, had symptoms, uh, was uh, medevaced off of the ship to a uh, hospital in San Antonio, into, sorry, medical treatment facility in San Antonio where he was tested and uh, was uh, unfortunately found to be positive with COVID. Uh, as a result, the Navy has, uh, using lessons learned from other cases, they have flowed a medical evaluation team, a specialized medical evaluation team, uh, onto the kid. Uh, I think it's an eight-person team that is uh, conducting testing on the ship. Uh, there have been other uh, other um, positive cases. I don't have the number, but I think the Navy will be able to uh, give that information later. Um, they are uh, preparing to uh, return to port, uh, where they will undertake efforts to um, uh, clean the ship. Uh, they will remove a portion of the crew from the ship uh, and work to uh, get everybody back to health and get the ship back to sea. But uh, that medical crew on the, on the ship right now has been conducting contact tracing, uh, has been working to isolate individuals they believe may have been exposed uh, and, uh, and take measures to protect the crew. Any follow-ups, Laura? Yeah, what, when do you expect they will need to go, uh, go into port and wh where, will they, where will they be docking and how long, is there an estimate of how long that they will have to be there? No, I, that, those are good questions for the Navy. I don't have the answers for, for the, those right now, um, but I, I believe the Navy will be able to provide some more details a little bit later today. All right, there. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, earlier you were talking about some of the steps the Pentagon is taking for returning to normal. Um, we've heard various senior defense leaders this week talk about a new abnormal and planning long-term for what impact has this virus had on the way the military operates. Um, I was just wondering if you could provide a few examples, like, for example, uh, a number of contracts have been vet for cloth masks, like millions of cloth masks. Um, how long do you think that the military will have to wear cloth masks, and is this really a permanent change of the way we do things? Yeah. So when I said normal, I, I, I think I, I said the new normal, I think, is the indication of what it would be, is, is that there are going to be changes to, to how we operate. Um, I, I think what you've seen, uh, to some extent, for, for the near term at least, uh, things like deployments, um, uh, where we're going to take an additional maybe time to, to screen people on the front end or the back end, uh, where uh, troops are going or sailors are going onto ships, we're taking time to maybe quarantine them as a group prior to putting them at sea and then test them uh, to make sure that they're not uh, they're not contagious. That that may that may continue for a little while. Um, uh, I think there will probably be some some other practices that will happen. Uh, you know, some of the social distancing practices may exist for a little while. Uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, 
maybe shaking hands with everybody you meet really isn't the most hygienic thing that people should be doing. And so uh, you, you may see some of those practices take place. I don't have any guidance on whether masks are here to stay. Um, I think that'll be something our medical providers will look at. As, as I mentioned earlier, is, you know, there's a lot of science going on behind this. We've got the teams up at Fort Detrick, and we've got other teams that are, that are looking into this uh, along with the whole of government CDC. So we'll be looking to, to their examples and the guidance from that whole of government uh, approach and that, that whole of science approach to get some guidance on what we should and shouldn't be doing and what things are here to stay and what things we can go back to normal with. And then just a follow-up, since the decision has been made on the comfort, how are people looking at the Mercy? Will the Mercy redeploy to San Diego? So I, with the with the comfort, um, that was at the request of uh, the governor and the mayor have indicated. So from our perspective, we look to state and locals, and we're providing um, the, the resources through FEMA that are requested, and that's what we've been doing from the start of this. Um, and so uh, I'm not familiar right at this point with, uh, with any determination by Governor Newsom uh, or the mayor of Los Angeles that they do not believe they need um, the mercy. Uh, I will say, though, that the mercy, uh, some of the crew of the mercy is actually in New York right now. Uh, and they have been uh, uh, helping uh, in New York in hospitals there. Uh, and as well, I think they've been actually off the ship helping in some uh, facilities in, in the city of Los Angeles as opposed to on the ship. So we've kind of gone from that model we originally anticipated of the need for beds to the need for doctors. And so we've moved the doctors to different places. So um, don't have a timeline on that. I would expect it at some point, obviously, that that will happen, whether that's this week or next week or in a couple of weeks. I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll go back to the back to the phone. Um, I will call on uh, Carla Babb. Uh, thank you for doing this. I just have a quick follow on the USS Kid. Uh, are there concerns of the Pentagon that this could be another uh, Teddy Roosevelt situation? And then I will ask my actual question. Well, I will count that as an actual question as well. Um, so I, I think the 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 good news is that um, uh, that. Because of uh, the fact that we have seen outbreaks on, on some of our naval vessels in the past, uh, there are lessons learned. I think that there is a, a high level of, of um, attention to the issue uh, from, from the Navy. I think that they have procedures in place, and they've activated them. So within 24 hours of the first uh, person who was symptomatic on the ship, uh, they had a, a medical team on that ship doing a detailed analysis and contact tracing and testing uh, of members of the crew. Uh, they've already put in place an effort to get the ship back to port quickly uh, and to uh, and to continue with the cleaning, uh, isolation of members, and the uh, and uh, getting crew members off that ship if necessary. So I, I think that there's a, the Navy has lessons learned from from prior experience with the with the COVID crisis, uh, and there are uh, have been quickly applying those to this case. So uh, fingers crossed, uh, the Navy's doing uh, uh, everything they can right now, and, uh, and we're going to hope for the best outcome, but we're going to take all the prudent steps that they possibly can. All right, so now to your, your second question. Okay, and oh, thank you. And then to my question about Chinese dis disinformation, we've seen a lot of repetition and regurgitation of these fake stories from China that are trying to pin the, or, uh, the origination of the virus to the U.S. military. There was something about Fort Detrick. There was something about Hawaii. Uh, there was something about Army people in Wuhan, U.S. Army people in Wuhan. What is the U.S. military doing now to stop this repetition of this fake news that's coming out of China? And do you believe that China is taking a page out of Russia's disinformation playbook? Uh, I, I don't know if it's a, if it's a playbook that Russia owns on its own. I, I think the the Chinese have uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party have have used uh, some of these measures in the past, and, and we've seen them. Uh, from the Department of Defense, our, we've been focused on on confronting the crisis. I think we've been uh, very direct in calling out what we see as misinformation, uh, and. Our hope is that the Chinese government and the Communist Party would would see this as an opportunity to work with the work with the the world, and to come to uh, a agreement to where sharing of information. I think this is the information that they have shared on the genesis of of the virus, the initial cases, the initial uh, positives has been lacking. Um, I think that's been uh, something that the, not only the United States but other governments have been clear on, and that that information is is vital to countering the COVID outbreak and information that uh, that would have been helpful uh, in a more timely manner. Uh, so we're optimistic that they will will see that this is uh, 
risk. This has been an opportunity for them to uh, be more transparent that they uh, probably need to, to reexamine the process on that. You know, the, the, they have had a, a much more aggressive effort in, uh, in uh, pushing uh, propaganda and misinformation, uh, whether it's, it's anonymous misinformation, as we've seen from some reporting, uh, or just their open use of, uh, of Twitter and Facebook by their foreign ministry and military personnel to, uh, to attack uh, other governments, not just the U.S., but, but uh, countries around the world. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I think the, the, the benefit of this is that a number of other countries around the world and a number of other of our allies and countries that we would like to be better partners with are, are opening their eyes up to this and that they're seeing uh, that, that possibly that China's um, promises and, and efforts and um, uh, are not what they're all cracked up to be and that there's a, there's a lot of misinformation out there uh, and that people need to, to look uh, more closely at what China's doing. Okay, uh, back to the room. Mike. Do you have the numbers on how many patients were actual, actually treated on the hospital ships? And does DOD, because the numbers are considered relatively small or definitely not up to capacity, yeah. does DOD assess the use as a, a good use of resources of these? Not, it's, not in, it's not inexpensive to use these ships. Um, I don't have, uh, let's see if I, I don't believe I have the comfort and mercy numbers on me right now, but I can definitely get those from Northcom. Uh, you're correct. The numbers were, you know, for a thousand bed hospital ship, which we had reconfigured for 500 for COVID, um, the numbers, we were not at capacity. At no point were we at capacity on the mercy or the comfort. Um, I think that they, they did treat a, a, a fair number of patients over the three weeks that they've been up in, up in uh, New York. Uh, and that is a value. Um, I think we have said all along that people have learned where this crisis was going to go. We've seen the numbers and prediction models uh, change as social distancing took place. Uh, and uh, and f if you look at a city like New York, the expectations were f a far worse situation than what we've seen. Uh, having our forces and having our people forward deployed uh, with that capability uh, and not needing it was far better than not having them there and needing it. So I don't think there's been any second guessing the deployment uh, of the comfort or the mercy. Um, all right, we'll go to the phone uh, again. We will go talk to um, uh, Courtney Cuby. All right, we'll go to Louis Martinez. Jonathan, thanks for. Uh in this briefing. Um, I have a question about the USS Kidd. Um, do you know if that vessel had had any ports of call recently um, that, uh, or uh, any other possibilities as to how this um, may have gotten aboard the ship if it's been at sea for yeah, a couple I, of months? Yeah, I later? don't have that information right now. I would I'd refer you to the Navy. I think they'll have some more information a little bit later today on this. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a newly developing um, issue. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that all of that will be looked at uh, as we move forward, uh, but I don't have that, that information for you right now, Louis. And if I could follow up on the uh, USS Roosevelt, um, with the idea now that some of the, the flow back of sailors onto the ship has um, been stopped because some asymptomatics are now presenting symptoms, um, what's, what's the timeline now for getting that ship back um, and is the idea now that you have to wait until everybody is fully healthy before everyone can get back on the ship? Well, I, I would first start with the, the fact that the, the Teddy Roosevelt, if needed, could pull up anchor tomorrow and head out to sea uh, and perform its mission. So that is, that's remained throughout, is that we've had a small number of symptomatic uh, sailors um, that, uh, that required uh, treatment. Uh, we, we had, a, unfortunately, uh, the, the one loss of life for a sailor um, from the TR, uh, but a, a very small number have been hospitalized. I think they're now the newest, the latest numbers are there are, only, there are four in the hospital, um, hopefully uh, uh, getting better daily. But that ship could pull up anchor and, and go, to, go to war right now if we needed it to. Um, the timeline has shifted. Um, as we've seen some additional symptomatic uh, patients show up or asymptomatic patients uh, um, show up as positive. Um, but 
that's out of caution. I mean, this is a learning environment. This is not something we've had to deal with. Uh, I think the, the hope from the, the Navy's perspective and from the department's perspective is we would rather take a little bit more time on the front end uh, to get to a place where we have more confidence that the crew is, uh, is, is safe and that the, the virus is no longer on the ship than be in a position um, a month from now where we're dealing with uh, a second wave. And so they're, they're taking their time. They're relying on the doctors. They're relying on the testing. Uh, we've ramped up our ability to do testing in Guam so that we can get uh, a larger number of tests done each day and, each, and rapidly, and we've seen that. We've gone through the entire crew has been tested, uh, and we'll start to see additional people tested as we uh, put people back on the ship. All right, uh, stay on the phone lines. Paul Handley, AFP. Hi, Jonathan. Um, a couple weeks ago, the Chinese deployed their carrier Liaoning, which did a semicircle around Taiwan, and they seem to step up activities in the South China Sea, confrontation with the Vietnamese vessels, and more exploration for oil. Does the Pentagon see this as taking advantage of uh, uh, the absence of the Roosevelt, of maybe distraction by the virus, uh, by the by the U.S. And what actions are you taking with the in sending the USS America to South China Sea, a kind of response to these. Well, I would, I, I would, I would challenge the premise of the question there a little bit. Uh, China has been very active in the South China Sea for for years. Whether it is um, uh, increasingly aggressive um, activity uh, in international waters or even in the littoral waters of, of neighboring countries, uh, the, the the recent ramming of a Vietnamese. Uh, uh, fishing vessel, as the Vietnamese have claimed, um, the building of, of, uh, of island fortresses with runways and uh, putting, uh, deploying uh, uh, aircraft and, and vessels into that area. Uh, I, would, I would argue they've had a, a pretty, uh, pretty busy schedule for some time in terms of their efforts to militarize the South China Sea. Um, whether they're, they're taking advantage of, of a, a crisis, a, a global crisis, uh, for which they were uh, on, the, on the front end of, uh, I, I won't say that. I, I think that they are uh, continuing with um, uh, their destabilizing activities that we have seen for, for many years. We were at, um, uh, in, in Thailand and Vietnam last uh, fall, I think in September. Um, in every meeting we had with our partners in the region, whether it was Australia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, um, all of the countries that were there, Japan, Korea, um, they all had a very similar message of uh, this is the type of behavior we see from China every day. Um, and, uh, and the U.S. has been uh, working with our partners to take a lead and standing up to that behavior and ensuring that China knows that that behavior is, uh, is not necessary and encouraging China to choose a different path. Uh, the international global system that has been in place since World War II has been uh, highly beneficial in terms of uh, raising the, uh, the, the, the wealth and living standards of, of billions of people around the world, including hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in China. Uh, and we want to see that international order remain. Uh, but China has continued to challenge it. They want to reorder our, order it. Uh, but we've increasingly seen people in the region push back, and we will continue to do so. Uh, I, I don't believe that the, the, the fact that the TR is currently in port uh, right now uh, has really had an impact on that. Uh, we have uh, additional vessels in the area. Uh, we've recently conducted a, a fun op through the, the Taiwan Strait uh, with another vessel. Uh, so I, I think our commitment to the region has been, been uh, constant and is very visible for the Chinese government. Can All right. I follow up? Has, do you think that over the time the U.S. operation and representation over the South China Sea have actually had an impact on China's uh, activities to expand its uh, operations there? So, so your your question is: Have our have our military operations in the South China Sea changed their behavior? Yes, pretty much. So. I think the, the operating assumption would have to be that, that they would likely be more aggressive uh, in their efforts to uh, expand uh, their, their geographic and uh, naval presence in the region if we weren't there. Uh, I also think that the important, other important aspect is uh, it's for our partners and allies in the region to see that we are committed. So uh, whether it's a, an effort to deploy vessels in a direct um, uh, show to the Chinese as much as it is to let our partners and allies know that we're there to encourage them to do similar things. And, and we've seen uh, 
uh, European countries and, and Asian countries step up on foreign uh, navigation operations that the U.S. has the lead on. Uh, we encourage that, and we believe that that's incredibly helpful for maintaining that, uh, that um, global order that's been in existence since uh, the end of World War II. All right, we'll do a, a couple more, and then I've, I've got to go. So we'll go to, uh, to Ellen uh, Milheiser. Hello. Um, about the personnel who have been sent to the um, Comfort from the Mercy, could you tell me if they're going to go back to the Mercy once the Comfort leaves New York City? So they, they, haven't, they haven't necessarily been sent to the Comfort. They've been sent to New York City. Um, so, uh, so they've been working either, uh, and I can get you the exact locations that whether they've been working on the comfort or working in the hospitals in New York, but, uh, they've been deployed, uh, in the region. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking at right now as to whether those forces would stay up there or whether, uh, the demand signal is enough, uh, is lessened enough that they can return to LA. Um, uh, but we, uh, we haven't, uh, I don't believe we've made a decision on that. All right, we'll go uh, last question to Travis Tritton. Hey, uh, Jonathan, thanks. Um, the administration has uh, suggested, you know, timelines for re reopening the country and um, the government. I'm just wondering, um, when do you expect some personnel will begin returning to the Pentagon building? Could that happen in mid-May? And um, what will that look like? And the second part of the question, the flip side of that is the, the teleworking. We've heard that a lot of these current telework arrangements could remain uh, post-pandemic. Is, is there any more clarity now on the scope of that or the number of the personnel? Should, the, you know, most uh, employees expect to be working at least part-time from home from now on? Thank that, you. So that's that's part of the planning that's that's uh, taking place right now. So I know WHS, um, uh, Tom Muir has been taking a look at that as well as uh, Dana Deasy with our CIO's office. I think he briefed uh, uh, either late last week or this earlier this week on the numbers. I think we've seen a, a massive increase in the number of people teleworking. I think some of our, I think DLA had 90% of their people were teleworking. We have uh, almost a million people who are teleworking uh, around the country. Um, do I expect that there will be changes? As I talked about at the beginning, I think that we're looking at a new normal. What does that look like? Um, and have we uh, – people have been uh, advocating for telework for many years. Uh, I think that you would see that there's probably going to be uh, – technology-wise, we've got uh, more resources in place. Uh, whether it's bandwidth, whether it's uh, the, the equipment to do it. Uh, so we're in a better place if we need to continue to do telework. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to look at that. Uh, I think that there is a, the Pentagon is open for business now. Um, we've, got, we've got reporters in here today. We've got staff that are in here. Uh, everybody's being careful about distancing. Uh, I think we'll open it probably in a, a very um, incremental manner. Uh, in similar to the way that we uh, we started to limit activities in the building uh, to ensure that we can maintain some of the, these best practices that we've seen develop over the last uh, the last few months. So uh, we'll we'll work on getting you guys a briefing from uh, from Tom Muir and, and the team on, uh, at WHS on on what we're going to be doing when we get to that place. Uh, I don't think we're there yet where we've made a decision on the timeline, but as we get closer, uh, we'll get you guys a briefing. And then I, I said last question, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take that back and go back to the phones for Tony Capaccio. I, I missed missed you on here, Tony. All right. Well, I was probably going to regret, regret letting him ask a question anyway, so I guess this works out. So, all right, guys. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming in. Have a have a good weekend and stay safe.